Well, hello, Mountain View family. We're so glad that you're joining us. However you're joining us, whenever you're joining us, we're glad that you're here with us this weekend. My name is Phil. I have the great honor of being your host and your speaker this weekend. Uh, before we get started, I have just a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, we would love to connect and remain connected with you. Um, and the best way to do that is to follow us online at mtnvw.org slash connect. There you can leave us prayer requests. Let us know um, anything you might need from us. Um, this is just a good way to keep the conversation going. Speaking of which, you can also follow us on all of our social media platforms, from Facebook to Instagram and YouTube. Uh, we encourage you to do that to stay up to date on the latest uh, that's going on here at Mountain View. And last but not least, if you would like to give to the ministry and the mission of Mountain View, you can do so at mtnvw.org slash give. All right, all the announcements are finished. We are ready to worship. Wherever you are, we encourage you to join us in singing today. Amen. Thanks, Phil. Friends, Psalm 27, 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall we fear? So let us not fear in this moment, but rather bask in his glory and rejoice with him in these words. Let's sing it out. Sing it out. Amen. Yeah. 
It's so wonderful to celebrate with you all an awesome and wonderful God. Amen. This is a song we introduced two weeks ago. It is a wonderful, loving reminder of the power of the resurrection of Christ. So let's celebrate that truth as well together, friends. Come on. Let's enter into his presence now, wherever you're at. Come on. This is Saturday. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. But since when is impossible? Never stopped here. Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Come on. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise making dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming. done with us. Even in this season where we're still, some of us are struggling more than others for sure. We just want to acknowledge that. We want to be real. But God's real. And God's not stopping. Let's sing this song together, church. Wherever you're at, wherever your heart is, wherever your journey is right now, let's just surrender it all to you. Uh, 
church together. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Like never before, God. Father, let your spirit just rain upon us wherever we're at. Father, we worship you, not just in a building, but we worship you, our lives worship you. Every step that we take is worship. Every thought, every action, every word that we use can be worship. Father, help us to remember and be reminded that we can worship you, not just through music, but in every aspect of our lives. you won't stop. Not in this season, not in the next, not forever and ever. 
So, Father, we just lift all our prayers up to you in this moment. And, Father, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to be responsive to your spirit, wherever we're at, wherever our journey is. If we're just getting to know you for the first time or if we've, we've been on this journey for a long time, Father, continue to fill our cups so that we can fill others. In your son's wonderful name, we all said amen. Amen. And I am so excited to be with you this weekend as we continue our series called Reboot. Now, I do remember when Ken came to me and he said, hey, I think we're going to try something new kind of in the middle of the summer. We were in a series and uh, then we decided to kind of put the hiatus on that one and move into the series called Reboot. And I thought it was a really good idea. Little did I know just how important this series, what we're talking about, was going to be just in our lives. We knew a lot was going on in the world and we knew a lot was going on in our our culture, which we just had no idea uh, what God was going to do with this series, and so far it's been amazing. Ken has done such a great job um, as we've been walking through some different ways that we can reboot this crazy year. And today I have the great honor and privilege to talk to you about what it looks like to reboot our conversations. Now I'm not <laughs> I'm not going to lie. This this is a hard one. Okay, this is a very hard one for a lot of reasons, because it's kind of a sensitive topic. It's a hard one because we are in an unprecedented time in our world where our faith is being put to the test and our morale is low, okay? This is a very, very difficult time. The last time I can remember feeling this way was on a particular day in September of 2001, September 11th, 2001 to be exact, I remember where I was, as most of us who were around during that time do, I was in Missouri. I was a young man in college at the time. It was a beautiful day, blue sky, and I remember sitting in the lobby of the dorm that I lived in, and the TV was on, and everyone in the dorm was out in the lobby, which was very rare, very early in the morning, and they were just glued to this TV set. And so I walk over to see what's going on, and I happen to walk in right at the moment where a plane hit the World Trade Center. And I'll never forget it as long as I live, because in that moment, in that instant moment, I was grieving. And my first stage of grief was denial. I was, I could not fathom such a thing taking place. I was so in denial that I was convinced that this was some really, really, really awful, like, premiere for some summer blockbuster coming up. It was so unbelievable to me that something like that would happen. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. My brain could not literally comprehend what I was seeing and what was taking place. Now, very soon, very quickly, once I realized that, no, this was real, this was happening in real life, then that denial instantly turned to another step in the stage of grief. I started to panic. I was afraid. I think a lot of us were afraid back then. I was afraid because I was far away from home and I was young. And I started to think to myself, worst case scenarios, because that's where my brain goes. I don't know where your brain goes when you're in a bad situation. Mine is absolute worst case scenarios. I'm playing out scenes like, what would I eat if all the food is gone? How, how far could I get in my car until I was empty in my gas and then I had to hitchhike the rest of the way home? Could my parents meet me halfway? What would it take and what would I be willing to do to make it across the country to get back to Oregon where my family lived? That's what I was thinking. Not long after that, my mom calls me, and she asked me how I was doing, and I said, oh, I'm okay, but inside I wanted to cry, and I just wanted to be home with my parents. In that moment, in the absence of information, there was a lot of confusion about what was going to happen next. Many of us were sure this was it. This was the end, World War III, the beginning of the end of modern civilization, and we weren't sure what was going to happen next. Lucky for us, the world continued. We continued on. 
And something really cool took place in the midst of all of this. My fears were quickly relieved when I started to see a change take place. And it was a change in conversation. All of a sudden, people at the grocery store, people at the gas station, everybody was really nice. They were very friendly. They were going out of their way to help others. There was this deep sense of unity that had taken place just kind of the whole country over. Even if you weren't in New York City, it happened to all of us. It impacted all Americans at a very, very deep, profound level. And there was this sense that we had to come together as a nation, as a country, as a people, and, and look after each other and help each other out during a difficult time. The conversation changed, and it was, it was actually very encouraging. People started to return to church in droves. It was a really interesting time to be alive and to be young. Now, fast forward to 2020, the year we're living in, and here we are. The world is experiencing a thing. We're all experiencing it together. But the conversation has changed. It's different. It's different. It's meaner. It's harsher. Instead of coming together in unity under this common thing that we are all experiencing, all of us all over the world are experiencing, our divisions are deeper than they have ever been. There is division and hatred in our country like I have never seen in my life. Our faith is being put to the test. And Paul says that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. But what I feel like I'm seeing more and more is that the testing of your faith is developing burnt-out Christians. And that makes me nervous. I think a big part of that has to do with the kind of conversations we're having and the conversations we're not having. So today I want to talk to you about conversations, what it means to reboot your conversation. Two conversations I think are important to reboot, and the first one is the one between you and God. We call that prayer, the conversation that you have on a regular basis with you and God. The second is the conversations we have with others, and those conversations are going to require two things, wisdom and communication. We're going to be looking at both of these conversations through the lens of Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, and this is why this is super, super, super important, because Paul writes this letter to the Colossian church, and it's really interesting because where we're going to be um, in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, is kind of towards the end of the book, and it's an interesting paragraph that I'm sure those of you who have read this book know and probably know really well and probably skipped over because it was probably maybe an afterthought as he was giving his goodbyes and, you know, saying pray for this and pray for that and all these people. But I think it's really, really important for us to take a second look at this passage of Scripture, chapter 4, because I think Paul hits it right on the nose where we need to be. Now, before we get into Colossians 4, I want to give you a little bit of a backstory about the book of Colossians. Interesting fact, uh, Paul did not start the Colossian church. It was actually star started by Epaphras and other converts um, as part of his missionary journeys. He actually never visited the Colossian church. So he didn't start it, and he never visited it, but he was writing a letter. And he was writing a letter to the church to combat some false teachings that were starting to take place and to take shape in the church. It was known as Gnosticism. These are people in our modern-day context who are spiritual but not religious, right? And all of the things probably work together, and all the different ways you approach spirituality all probably come together. And at the end of the day, we can all agree on big idea spiritual things, but Jesus Christ is not God. There's no way it's not possible. So we can agree on all the other spiritual aspects except the Jesus Christ thing. And Paul spends a lot of time in his letter saying, nope, that's not true. It's not right. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Here's why. Here's the proof. Here's the evidence. Here's how you know. And this is kind of how the letter breaks out. Now, he wrote this letter, interesting fact, while he was in prison. Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison in Rome awaiting trial. Interesting. Now, I want you to keep this backdrop in mind as we are walking through this passage of Scripture together, because Paul was facing some severe persecution when he wrote the letter. He was in a really tough season of life. Sound familiar? In addition, Paul was combating false teachings from both outside and inside the church. He was trying to help the church discern the truth from the lies and all the chaos of life. Sound familiar? What an interesting time Paul was in. What an interesting time we're in. So without further ado, here it is, the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 2. This is the first thing that Paul says to the church. This is what he wants them to do. He says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. 
Man, Paul comes out swinging when he tells the church to be in constant conversation with God because prayer was supposed to be the primary characteristic of the early church. That's how they're going to know we are Christians, by the way we converse with God. Maybe it should also be the primary characteristic of the modern church, amen? Devote yourselves. That's a really interesting phrase. Devote yourself is literally translated to persist in. Persist in. It's the same concept as when Paul commands the church to pray without ceasing in his other writings. Persist in. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now, within this context of devoting yourselves to prayer is this idea, two ideas. One is watchfulness, and the other is thankfulness. Now, this is interesting, watchfulness and thankfulness. Paul says, devote yourselves, persist in prayer, being watchful. In other words, what he's saying is, pay attention, church. Devote yourself to prayer and also pay attention. The Colossian church was supposed to understand the circumstances surrounding them, especially the circumstances that could affect the spread of the gospel. In other words, our prayers are supposed to be true to the times in which we live, so that they can be informed prayers. Informed prayers. How many of you have ever heard a preschooler pray? Anyone? I have, not just because I live with a preschooler, but because I work with a lot of preschoolers. Preschool prayers are the absolute best, okay? And they usually go one of two paths, okay? Either the preschooler prays some groovy chant song like that they heard at their Christian preschool, you know, and they sit down at the dinner table, and you say, hey, you want to pray for us? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, God is great. God is good. Now let's eat this awesome food. Amen. Like it's like some weird, like, hey, Mickey, and you don't see it coming, and it kind of makes you laugh. So that's one track. You either pray like a chant you heard, or they just pray really big prayers to a really big God. And it's usually like, God, you made the sun, and you made the moon, and the stars, and you made the trees, and all these things. And God, thank you for all the grandma and grandpas, and thank you for all the mommies and daddies, and thank you for all the pets, and it's like all the things, and it could go on and on and on and on and on, kind of like this sermon. And, uh, and you start to realize uh, that this is the beginnings of prayer. It's good that they pray this way. God hears their prayers. It's an honor thing to him that, that our children are thankful for all of these amazing things that they have in their lives. But as we get older, our prayers Kind of like our brains, as our brains develop, our prayers are also supposed to become more advanced. They're supposed to become a little more informed. Informed prayers are powerful prayers. Informed prayers are personal prayers. Informed prayers are purposeful prayers. Informed prayers are more personal because it ends up being someone you know or someone you've heard of. Instead of praying for all the mommies and all the daddies, instead you say, God, please pray for Dan. You get very specific about a person and the circumstances surrounding that person. Informed prayers are more purposeful because it focuses your mind and energy on very, very specific issues. God, please pray for Dan, who is dealing with cancer. That's very specific. Informed prayers are personal, and they're purposeful, and they're powerful, because if God answers that prayer, then you can look back and point to God and say, see, we prayed this thing, and God delivered. God, please be with Dan, who's struggling with cancer, heal his body. And then we watched how God, and only God, could deliver. Informed prayers are personal, and purposeful, and powerful. The second part that Paul points out within prayer, outside of being watchful and giving very informed prayers, is to be thankful. Thankfulness. Now, I think this is the part that we probably struggle with more than most, especially when we're in the struggle, kind of like right now, when we're in the thick of it. It is hard sometimes to see through the fog of everything going on in your life when you're in it. Do you know what I'm saying? It's hard to be like, oh yeah, there's so much to be thankful for when it feels like there's really, really nothing to be thankful for. And if anyone knows what it means to be in it, to be in the struggle, it's Paul. Because as you might recall, where was Paul when he wrote this letter? That's right, in prison. Paul was in prison when he wrote this very letter. Now listen, I've been in prison. I should clarify. I have not 
been in prison, not me, not me personally. I was, I was like Monopoly. I was just visiting. I was there doing work. I was in prison ministry when I was in college. That would have been awkward because I work with all your kids for a living. But no, not in prison myself, but there doing ministry. And I have been to every kind of prison. I have been to a general population prison, which they call Gen Pop, which is kind of a little bit uh, less restrictive, and the prisoners have a little more room to move around and to do certain things. And I have been in maximum security prisons and had a conversation about Jesus with a convicted murderer. I have experienced prison. It is a very hopeless place. There's just this deep, deep sense of hopelessness that kind of surrounds the entire thing. For whatever reason you're there, however you got there, there's just this sense of hopelessness. And it's heavy, and it weighs really, really, really heavy. So imagine, this is a modern-day prison, right? So now imagine a prison in Paul's day. Imagine a Roman prison. It was probably not very sanitary. It was probably not a very comfortable place to be. And my guess is that it was probably a very depressing place. I can see how it would be really easy for Paul to become discouraged. Don't you? But in order to keep a proper perspective, this is what Paul urges the Colossian church to do. He says when you pray, and you're going to devote yourselves to prayer because that's the characteristic of the church, when you pray, you need to pray with an attitude of thankfulness. Thankfulness. Watchfulness, informed prayers, and thankfulness. Even in the midst of all the things that are going on, we see God at work. Because a watchful prayer and a thankful prayer clearly sees the obstacles. I'm not blind. I see what the problems are. I see the obstacles that lay before us. But I acknowledge that God is able to work in spite of and in the midst of my circumstances. That's a watchful prayer and that's a thankful prayer. I am aware, and I pray specifically for the things that are going on in my country and my world, and for the personal health and safety of all the friends and family and of all the people. I get very specific, and I am thankful because I know that God is at work. This might come as a surprise to you, but COVID-19 did not come as a surprise to God. Which means if it doesn't come as a surprise to him, there's probably a plan. And even if you don't see it or understand, it doesn't mean that it's not true. We trust in God to see us through, and I promise you, he will see us through. It won't be probably tomorrow. We might have to be in it for a little bit, but one day we will be on the other side of this. We'll be on the other side, and we'll get to look back and see how God was at work. We are devoted to prayer, watchful prayer, thankful prayer, fully knowing that our situation doesn't have to affect our joy. When's the last time we've prayed like that in the last four months? When's the last time you had a conversation with God where it ended with thankfulness and joy? My guess is that's been harder to find these days. In addition to watchful and to thankful prayers, Paul asked the Colossian church to do something else. He asked the church to pray for an opportunity for him to minister to others. Remember, he's in prison. He's asking the church, hey, also pray for an opportunity for me to minister to others. He says as much in verse 3, and pray for us too, Paul says, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So we can proclaim the mystery of Christ. Do you want to know why Paul was in chains? Because he was going around telling people that Christ in me is a thing. That Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, Christ in me, and it rubbed people the wrong way. They couldn't handle that. And that's why he was in chains. And here he is saying to the church, hey, also pray for me that while I'm in chains, writing you this letter in a disgusting prison, pray for an opportunity for me to minister. When I'm at my lowest point, pray that God would open up doors for me to minister and to spread and to share the gospel message. Now that's faith. That's faith. It's faith because the only person who could even make those opportunities possible would be God. That's it. He's in chains. What is he possibly going to do? Only God is going to make a way for him to minister. So here's my question for you. How many of you, in the midst of trying times right now, are praying for opportunities to minister to others? 
Paul was in prison for proclaiming Christ in me. We, who are not in chains and enjoy all of the freedoms, are caught proclaiming everything but Christ in me. Christ in me. When's the last time you prayed for an opportunity to minister? Devote yourselves to prayer. If we want to reboot our conversations, it has to start with our conversation with God. So you devote yourselves to inform prayers. And then you're thankful for the blessings of God, even in the midst of trying circumstances. You ask God to fill your heart with joy, even in trying times. You ask God to give you opportunities to minister to others, even in trying times. Devote yourselves to prayer. Watchfulness. I know what's going on. I'm very aware of the obstacles. And thankfulness, because I'm thankful because I know that God will see us through it. This is the beginning of rebooting conversations. It's time to talk to God more and talk to Facebook less. Let's pray some bold prayers like this one and see what God does with it. I want to switch gears a little bit because now we talked about the idea of rebooting our conversation with God, which only naturally leads us to talking about rebooting our conversations with other people. Here's an interesting petition in verse 4 of Colossians. The second petition Paul makes to the church says this, pray that I may proclaim it, he's referring to the gospel, clearly, listen to this part, as I should. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, the NIV translates this phrase as proclaim, right? But a better translation would be to manifest the gospel. Pray that I may manifest the gospel as I should. And that's really, really important because what Paul is really asking here is for wisdom in clearly communicating and living out the gospel of grace. Paul looked for new opportunities in prison to make much of the name of Jesus Christ. And in addition, he prayed that he would do justice to the nature of the gospel so that his witness to others would be clear. So that his witness would be clear. In other words, Paul didn't want to do or to say anything that would be damaging to his ability to reach people who are far from God with the gospel. He didn't want to do or say anything that would damage his witness. And do you know what that's going to require? Wisdom. That's going to require wisdom. Paul says as much in verse 5, Be wise, he says, in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Literally, this translation, Paul says here, In wisdom, be walking. In wisdom, be walking. In wisdom, be walking. I'm going to have that made into a shirt and just me like this. In wisdom, be walking. At the beginning of his letter to the Colossian church, interesting, Paul prays for the Colossians to know wisdom. And here we are at the end of his letter, and now Paul is praying for them to live wisdom. At the beginning, it is no wisdom. At the end, it is live wisdom. And wisdom is necessary because of these outsiders that Paul refers to here, people who are not Christians, people who are far from God. Those who are far from God need living examples of the wisdom of God. Spoiler alert, you're that living example. You're supposed to be anyway. You're supposed to be the living example. Now, Paul's concern here was not wisdom for wisdom's sake, but for non-Christians' response to the gospel. Now, I'm going to pause here just for a minute because I have thought very long and very hard about what I wanted to say about this topic. And I, and I hate to be the person that's always dragging on social media. I hate to be that person, all right? But social media platforms seem to be the place where conversations are being had. And I have to say, I, I'm disappointed in the conversation. I'm disappointed in our conversation. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that there are some really good and important conversations that are happening on social media, but they're few and far between. I'm not disappointed in the world's conversations. I don't expect much from the world. I'm disappointed in our conversations, in Christian conversations. How many of you actually think, be honest, how many of you actually think before you press publish or send or post, how many of you think this thought? Is what I am about to post 
going to damage my ability to be a witness for Jesus Christ to outsiders. How many of you think that before you ascend it? Is what I'm about to do going to help or to hurt my ability to witness to outsiders on behalf of Jesus Christ? This was on the forefront of Paul's mind while he was in prison. So much so that he asked for prayers from the church that he would represent Christ as he should. As he should. Now listen, you may be right. You may be totally right. Your opinion on a current world issue, it may be spot on. It may be Christ-centered. It may be God-fearing. It may be biblically sound. But if you cannot communicate it in a way that demonstrates your love for others, then don't say it. Or at the very least, pray and ask God if you should. Paul, in another letter to a church in Corinth, he says it this way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Did you hear what he said? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't love, then I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Would you like a visual to demonstrate that? My pleasure. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, and I don't have love, then all I am is noise. Just noise, loud noise all the time. This is it. Always, always. Do you know how annoying that is? Do you know how awful that sounds? Stop making noise. Start making disciples. This is what God calls of us. You could have all the answers to fix all the world's problems. And you might be right. But if you don't know how to communicate it in a way that demonstrates to the outsiders that you genuinely care and love for them, then you're just noise. Stop making noise. Start making disciples. But Phil, sometimes, you don't get it, sometimes I, sometimes I just need to vent. Yeah, me too. <laughs> sometimes every day. So you know what I do? I talk to my wife or some close friends or staff members that I know I can trust. And if they're not around, then I go outside and I lift heavy things until my back gives out. Find a way. There are ways to handle the need to vent without damaging your witness, without breaking relationships. Phil, you don't understand. Everyone that I'm friends with on social media, they love me and they know me and they know my heart. Do they? That's a bold statement. I'm friends with a lot of you on social media. I know you. I love you. I believe you mean well. Sometimes I question your motives. Did you know that friends of your friends can see stuff that you post on social media if you're not tech savvy enough to know how to block that on the back end, which most of you aren't because I can see stuff even if I'm not your friend? What about those people? What do you think they conclude about you? Well, that's not fair. Phil, that's not fair. Why would anyone assume they know me by the things I post on Facebook? Why would you assume they wouldn't? The kind of person that you portray to the world, you want us to believe in personal space you're different? Then communicate that in every place, in every platform. In every platform. Well, Phil, that's not fair. This is just cancel culture manifesting itself. You're right. You're absolutely right. But the reality is cancel culture is here and it's probably not going away. Kind of like we tell our teenagers when they get introduced to social media. We say to them, do not post and say things that you would be embarrassed for your parents, for your boss, for your future spouse, for your children, and for your God to see. I think the same applies to us because it impacts our witness. We have got to reboot our conversation. Paul makes a bold statement at the end of verse 6. He says this, Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Here's the point. Words matter. They matter. Conversations matter. Both what you say and how you say it matters, especially when it comes to your witness. 
There are two ways that Paul describes how Christians should talk. He says you should talk full of grace, and you should talk salty. Let's talk about that full of grace concept for a minute. What Paul really means here is this, that the words that come out of your mouth should always reflect a life that lives in a constant state of grace, both given and received. Remember, because Paul would try to remind you all the time, you were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works so that nobody can boast. If that is the case, every word that comes out of your mouth should be a reflection of that grace. You are just living in a perpetual state of grace. That's hard to do. We're not perfect at it. Thank God for more grace. Isn't that wonderful? You are supposed to live and speak and communicate to people like one who has been saved by grace. You are supposed to live a life that freely gives grace because grace has freely been given to you. So when Paul makes it abundantly clear that your conversation should always be full of grace, he wasn't kidding. It should be full of grace naturally because that's the only way we have life and freedom is by the grace that was freely given to us. So let us reflect that in our conversation. Let's talk about words that are salty. Now, not salty in our current cultural context, not like, hey, salty Karen strikes again. It's not salty like that. It's not bad. It's not bitter. It's actually seasoned. That's the word that Paul uses. In this context, Paul wants your words to be acceptable and inoffensive, seasoned. It's good. Your conversations with others should be full of grace, and they should be seasoned. Now, when Paul and the other apostles, when they confronted large groups of people, many times people took offense. That is to be expected, okay? The gospel is offensive. Even Jesus says, look, if the world hates you, just remember, it hated me first. This is supposed to happen. This is expected, okay? Not everyone in the world is going to be team Jesus. Our message is going to offend people. But let the gospel be offensive, not you. Let the gospel be offensive, When people are offended by the gospel, do you hear the difference? When they're offended by the gospel, what's really happening is they are being confronted with their own sin. Because the gospel has this uncanny ability to expose sin for what it is and our need for a savior. When people are offended by you, it could very well prevent them from ever having access to the gospel. Do you hear the difference? Offended by the gospel means they're struggling with some real heart issues. It's to be expected. Not everybody's going to receive that well. It's hard to be told you're a sinner, and there's a lot of stuff that might need to be... That's a hard pill to swallow. When they're offended by you, they might not ever get to the message of the gospel. There's a quote by a man named Carl McCullman. He wrote this really great blog on, in the midst of kind of COVID, about how to converse with people who are different than you. And I love this line, and I think I'm going to use it every time I'm having a conversation with someone who's different than me. This is what he says. He says, look, I'm not here to convert you or argue with you. I'm here to have a conversation, which means I'm here to listen to you. I'm not here to convert you. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm here to have a conversation, which means I'm here to listen to you. Because it's about listening over judgment. It's about compassion over being right. It's about relationship over labels. I firmly believe that if we do the hard work of rebooting our conversations now, when we are on the backside of this pandemic, there will be a harvest. We will get to reap the harvest. But we're going to have to start now in rebooting our conversations, first with God, then with others. We need to be better at talking to God. We should probably be talking to God more. The world's in a crazy state. Who knows how long it's going to last? We have got to reboot our conversations with other people, express to them that we love and care for them, that we're in this together, that we're going to see you through to the end. Can you imagine what a difference it would make in our world if every Christian on social media rebooted their conversation? I firmly believe by the end of this, when we can all just gather together freely, churches would be packed to the brim. It's going to require us to reboot our conversation. If we do it now, I really believe that God really wants to usher in a harvest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have in the midst of very, very strange and difficult times to reboot our conversations. God, this is a hard topic because we're talking about things that are very personal to us and near and dear. God, help us to focus our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. 
God, that's what it's about. Let our speech communicate that. Let our actions communicate that. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. As we get ready to partake of communion, if you are at home and you want to gather your communion elements now, today I want us to just think on Christ. Think on the amazingness that is the freedom that we get from the grace of God. How it's changed your life, how it is constantly shaping and transforming you into his likeness. This is something that God wants for everyone, for all people. The apostles, Paul, they knew that. This is why Paul wrote so many letters to the churches trying to help them course correct saying, no, it's not like that, it's actually like this. Remember, you used to be like the outsiders, and the only thing that gives you permission to be on the inside is Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. It's the only thing that gives you clearance. So pray. And when you communicate anything to people, communicate grace that's only found in Jesus Christ. As you get ready to take your emblems, just remember. Remember what Christ did for you. Remember Christ is the only thing that makes you an insider and not an outsider. And then remember the calling of the church to go out into the world and bring all the outsiders in. Bring them home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the reminder that we too were once outsiders and we get to be called your children because of Jesus Christ. And for that, we will always be grateful. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I surrender all. I surrender all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. We surrender all. Yes, we surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, we surrender all.
Let's surrender it all together today. Yes, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, God, and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. And this is why, oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Yes, I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, but you still call me friend. Cause I got up a mountain, is the God of a valley, and there's not a place. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, nothing.
Thank you so much for joining us, friends. We pray you have a blessed week, and we can't wait to see you again next week. God bless.